Well, hello, our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow shining stars. Our next trolley stop is here, and our next trolley stop is now. Welcome back to another all-new episode of PR from the Heart's Children's Book Spotlight Series. To be precise, we have reached episode number 214. That is the 214th trolley stop here at PR from the Heart, here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series, as part of our summer reading season, one of our favorite times of the year. My name is John Massalonis, the manager of PR from the Heart, and joined, as always, by my faithful furry friend and companion, and forever friend, and co-host of the Children's Book Spotlight Series, a little Shih Tzu Maltese, little Forrest. He's now just enjoying a nice little collagen treat on his end of things as well. We hope that you are continuing to enjoy your summer and your summer reading season, wherever you are and wherever you may be. It's hard to believe it, but sooner than we know it, the month of July is going to be around the corner and the back to school season will be around the corner. But we do have part to enjoy every single month. We're piping the brakes, so to speak, here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series, because during the summer reading season, there are so many amazing things that you can do. One of which is to head on over to your favorite local library. If you are a longtime viewer and listener and supporter of the Children's Book Spotlight Series and our sister show, The Neighborly Reviews Bookcast, co-hosted by our dear friend and fellow neighbor. You remember him and you love him as the beloved Mr. McFeely on the popular long-running children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We know him and we love him as David Newell. We say here, one of our calling cards at PR From the Heart is, is that... Local libraries, children's and independent bookstores, they truly are the pillars of our community. Now, not to date myself, but I remember when you could go into libraries and they had a little item called a card catalog, so to speak, right? Now, again, everything is electronic, so to speak. But you know what? Libraries really, we see a lot of things that change over time. We see restaurants that are closing down. We see just our world changing in so many ways, way, shapes, and forms. And this is why it's so important, maybe now more than ever before, to support your local libraries. There's different things that you can do when you go to a local library. If you've never stepped into a library before, if you're wondering, what are the good, do libraries even still exist? There might even be some people that are out there that are saying, do libraries even exist? Thanks to one brand new children's book that we're going to be featuring here on this week's episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series. We're not only going to be giving a shout out to libraries, but we're going to be giving a love letter to libraries. That really sounds perfect as we continue to be fully immersed in our summer reading season. We encourage all of you, again, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, or fellow shining stars to head on over to amazon.com and purchase your copy of a love letter to my library it is now available courtesy of our friends and neighbors at sourcebook kids one of the many ways that you can pledge your support for our featured guest here on the children's book spotlight series this week episode number 214 for lisa katzenberger is to leave a five-star review for a love letter to my library. That's just one of the many ways that you can pledge your support for her to let her know that she's doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and for those who love great children's books. If you head on over to your favorite children's and or independent bookstore or your favorite local library and they do not stock their copies of a love letter to my library, make that kind recommendation. Let them know that you heard about Lisa's brand new children's book on the children's book Spotlight Series, to be precise, our 214th trolley stop. And we have some other cool books. This is a very big year for Lisa. So we're going to be talking about some of her other new releases as well, which we also encourage all local libraries to be able to stock as well too. The trolley, we rack up mileage during the summer. You know, there's nothing wrong with a little summer road trip. And we provide those regularly here throughout our summer reading season here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series. The trolley travels all the way across the country from San Diego, California, all the way to the central time zone, the beautiful city of Chicago, Illinois, joining us for her return to the Children's Book Spotlight series. It's always good to have fellow neighbors return back to the program. She reminded us on episode number 141 of the program that it's okay to feel your feelings, that it's okay to express your emotions. We've also included the link to episode number 141 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series to see how far that we've gone and grown together individually and collectively since we last connected with one another back in February of 2022. Joining us as our featured guest author here on this week's episode of the Children's Book Spotlight Series, 
children's author Lisa Katzenberger. Lisa, it's great to reconnect back with you. Thank you for spending some free time with us. And again, it's even though when we connected, it was on the other side of the pandemic. It's really good to be more on the on the on the real side of civilization, so to speak. Thanks for joining us once again on the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to be back. Yes, yes, yes. It, it's, as I mentioned, it's always great. It's always a good feeling in the words of our fellow friend and favorite neighbor, Mr. Rogers, that um, when we can reconnect with some of our fellow neighbors in the press. Little housekeeping before we continue to proceed forth. We encourage all of you, if you are new to our neighborhood, if you are a first time listener and viewer of the Children's Book Spotlight series, or if you've been with us since day one. As you know, we are shortly upon, just literally around the corner, the 10-year anniversary celebration of being of service to children's authors across the country and around the world. And then shortly after that, the six-year anniversary celebration of the Children's Book Spotlight series. But in the meanwhile, you can pledge your support for us here at the program. You can pledge your support for Lisa by subscribing to PR from the Heart's official YouTube channel and sharing this very special trolley stop that you are now enjoying. Episode number 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. Join the near 16,000 members of the PR from the Heart family through our official YouTube channel. So again, a, a lot has happened. It's so interesting because I think that the pandemic did something with time because it feels like so much more now happens during the course of a day, let mm -hmm. alone two years, than kind of way back in the day, so to speak. Um, obviously, there is a lot to discuss in terms of the books that you have, especially, of course, as we're, as we're spotlighting a love letter to my library here on episode number 200 and 14 of the children's book spotlight series what has these past two years been like for you because again you know being being a creative on your end of things you know always working on on new projects if you could really encapsulate like within a word or a sentence how have the past two years been for you with where you're at currently as of right now i would say the word i would use is growth um, I have continued to write additional picture books, but I also um, dipped my toes into writing longer form books. I have a chapter book series coming out, and I'm also working on a middle grade novel. That is a really hard project for me, and it's a big change from writing a story in 500 words to writing a story with 40,000 words. So the past couple of years, I've really just tried to challenge myself. I've written my first nonfiction picture book, which is coming out in October. And um, I'm just trying to, you know, to do more and push the boundaries of my creativity. I love that. And, and I feel that again, you know, one of the things that the pandemic reminded us is to not play small, there's no small potatoes here on the children's book spotlight series, right? You know, potatoes are delicious in their form, but not the small potato variety when it comes to, to creativity. For those who didn't have the opportunity to tune into our previous trolley stop episode number 141, which again, we have included in the description below. Could you share with those who are learning about your work for the first time? There's always an origin story. We're big on origin stories here at the Children's Book Spotlight series. There's always two origin stories. There is the origin story of the author. There's the origin story of their children's book, or in this particular instance, children's books. For those who are unfamiliar with your work, who are learning about you for the first point in time, could you give a little bit of a refresher course? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it be during the summer or, you know, people are catching this during the back to school season, it's always good to have a little refresher every now and again, because, you know, especially if you meet so many new people, and let's say you haven't seen someone in a couple of years, it's always a matter of getting that, that refresher course, so to speak. So where did things really first begin for you on your end of things when you knew that a large part of your mission, your purpose, was to better the lives of children and bring more families together across the country and around the world? Um, so I've been a writer since I was a kid. I took creative writing courses in junior high and high school and college. I got my major in journalism. I worked as a technical writer. So I've always been writing and doing professional writing for my career and creative writing on the side. But it wasn't until I became a mom that I started writing for children because I would go to my library and sit with them or hopefully sit with them on my laps. I have twins, so I'm trying to wrangle two toddlers at once and listen to stories. And I got reintroduced to the picture book market that is thriving today that I didn't really have when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I remember reading little golden books 
the monster at the end of this story, um, things like that, the pokey, pokey little puppy. Those are the books that I grew up with as a younger child. Um, so I decided to try my hand at writing for children. And when I did, it felt like everything clicked. I was like, oh, this is, this is what I was meant to do. This is what I want to do. And so writing stories for children started, my kids are 13 now. I started probably when they were maybe two. So for about 11 years, I've been writing, um, writing for kids and they were my inspiration. I really love how when things are inspired by real life situations or experiences or people for that matter as well too. And um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've, I've briefly alluded to and we'll be hearing more about this as well is I, I've been uh, working hard behind the scenes at uh, finishing and completing the manuscript for my first children's book, which is gonna be coming out in March. And that was inspired by the transition of my grandmother being able to have that real, th th that heartbeat. So it's not just, you know, it's very easy to say, well, I'm gonna write a book about, you know, a dog. But if you have a personal experience with a dog, if you've been a dog owner on your end of things, right? It, it makes that story that much more heartfelt. I really love the fact that you are expressing your creativity in different forms. Mm -hmm. And before we dive into a love letter to my library, I, I feel that's that, that's really a reminder for all of us, because one of the things I feel that the pandemic also taught us is, is that many of us wear different hats, right? And we have, you know, it's very easy to identify ourselves as one thing, publicist, soon to be children's author, children's author and mom. We have these labels. We're so used to these labels, but we really have more creativity than we actually realize. Could you specifically talk to that thread about, you know, us being parents and caregivers and custodians of children, why we need to really do an even better job of reminding kids of not even just their creativity, but the depth of their creativity while do while providing that same reminder to ourselves as as big kids, as grown adults as well, too. Yeah, um, you know, I I like to say that my kids are always paying attention to me, not because I'm so awesome, but because kids are so observant. What I model in my behavior, not just what I say, not what I tell them, but the fact that they, you know, come down on a Saturday morning in their PJs and I'm sitting in my library working on a book, they understand that that's important to me if I'm going to be doing that at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. So they see that hard work that I put in. They see the action that I'm taking to fulfill what I tell them has really been a dream of mine since I was their age to be an author and to have books published. And um, my daughter is actually at a creative writing camp, stay away camp this week as we speak. That was her choice for summer camp. So she's exploring her creativity as well. And I think it's great to model your behavior for kids and to support them and um, let them, but also let them find their own path. That's, uh, and I'm really glad that you touched upon that as well too, because, you know, um, we're, we're doing our part, this generation's uh, parents and caregivers and custodians and educators, we try not to be of the helicopter variety, so right. to speak, and, and or control our kids, to, just to allow them to, to experience things on their own, still you know, being pillars of support for them as well too, but allowing them to connect with their creativity and allow them to be able to learn more about themselves. It's part of the exploration and the growth process of being a child. I really love how this book, A Love Letter to My Library is now available. It's so interesting because um, there, there, there's so much celebration as we discussed in the PR from the Heart Green Room. It's hard to believe that it's going to be four years this fall from when I made the decision to move out from the Buffalo, New York area out here to San Diego. And I remember living in Buffalo, my previous residence, I lived next door to a library. It was literally, I walked outside my residence and next door. And there was a part of, of time in my life where I'm like, you know, sometimes when you look on the surface and, you know, you might have some struggling days where it's like, I don't know what I'm grateful for, right? You know, people have the infamous, uh, you know, challenging day, challenging month, proverbial divine storm, so to speak. But I remember by the time that I left Buffalo, I said, I literally lived in a palace. Like I live next door to a library. How absolutely amazing is that? 
Um, shifting gears to the origins here before we dive into the pages, before we crack the cover and dive into the pages for a love letter to my library. Could you share with us, because this really is a personal connection for you, not even just being a children's author and going into libraries and doing events, you have your own personal connection to this story. Could you share with us a little bit more about the origin story of A Love Letter to My Library? And I'm fascinated as well, working with Rob, your illustrator. He's not just any illustrator. He's a New York Times bestselling illustrator. Many people obviously know his work. He's the illustrator of Arlo Draws an Octopus, Cupid the Valentine's Day Pig, and of course, Seth Meyers, New York Times bestseller, I'm Not Scared. So for, for those who are learning about children's books for the first point in time, when you are a published author, you're not necessarily on the phone like with your bestie until, you know, two in the morning every night saying, hey, loved love the new illustrations, right? Let's talk tomorrow, right? That kind of thing. You have to trust and hope that the illustrator that you're being aligned with really connects to the heart of your of your project. And it really feels like Rob and you are really in step and in sync with one another. So if you could then also share about not even just the the process of the book coming to life in terms of your inspirational piece, but being partnered up with Rob and what that has been like for you, knowing the fact that, you know, he's he's attached to this project. Yeah. So I wrote this story, my first idea for um, for the manuscript was a thank you letter. I was thinking of it to say thank you to the library. And I was thinking of an experience of all the things that libraries have to offer beyond just books. They offer inclusiveness, they offer safe spaces, they offer technology, they offer arts and crafts. There's so much that a library stands for, and I wanted to address all of that in this story. And I had to work to figure out how to frame the story so that there was still a narrative arc. It wasn't just a list of things that a library offers. And my vision was that I was following a child um, on a single trip to a library, one library visit. But then when Rob came in and did the art, he took the perspective of having it be a community of children and following lots of different children from lots of different backgrounds um, into their own library experience. So he really brought a new layer and a new depth to this story, which I appreciate so much. And I just think he did a really fabulous job with the art and understanding the heart and the love that's in this story. And that is truly felt. One of the really good things is that when you when you open up a children's book, and we'll be doing that officially momentarily here for a love letter to my library, but when you can really see that the author and the illustrator are in sync, that there's no uh uh what's what's the word that I'm looking for? That there's there, there's really proficient flow within the story and, and especially being able to and we'll put a pin in this and we'll circle back on this thread momentarily is the fact that you know you and i like we grew up with libraries right and kids mm -hmm. have so many more i could use the word choices which is true i could use the word distractions which may even be that much more true right so it's a matter of like you know with, with kids being in this instantaneous uh screen time this and just anything disposable at their fingertips some kids may wonder, like, what's the point of going to a library? But we'll talk about that momentarily. We are almost ready to crack the cover and dive into the pages. Of our featured children's book here on the Children's Book Spotlight is one of our favorite times during every episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series. Joining us again is our featured guest, children's author Lisa Katzenberger. We encourage all of you, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and, of course, our fellow shining stars, to head on over to Amazon.com if that is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. You can leave a five-star review after purchasing, enjoying, and reading your copy of A Love Letter to My Library if you feel called and inclined to do so. Again, one of the many ways you can pledge your support for Lisa, for her illustrator, Rob, and for the team at Sourcebook Kids is to leave a five-star review for A Love Letter to My Library that's letting them know that they're doing wonderful and much-needed work for children, parents, families, educators, for those who love great children's books. We've also included the link to Lisa's official website below as well, too, if you'd like to be able to have ordering instructions for her book there in the process. We also encourage as well you too by heading on over to your favorite local library, your favorite children's and or independent bookstore. If they do not stock their copy of A Love Letter to My Library, make that kind recommendation. Let them know that you heard about it here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. And for all 
educators, teachers, principals, librarians, superintendents who are facilitating your back to school season, author school visits, or simply for the 2024-2025 school year, not just the back to school season, you can connect with Lisa via her official website, which we've included in the description below to connect with her to facilitate your own author school visit for the back to school season and or for the upcoming 2024-2025 school year. It's interesting because every once in a while, I, I have a little struggle saying 2024, 2025, because I realized I graduated grammar school in 1995. And like just the 90s, it just flowed. And when you say, you know, it's 2020, it's every year, just one passing year to be able to, to add on. I feel that the timing of this book right now, I mean, not even just, you know, perfect for the summer reading season and libraries, our air condition. If you are tuning into this week's episode of the Children's Book Spotlight Series and wondering, what are the great things about a library? Atop the list, it's a cooling center, right? But in many respects, libraries, they're not just pillars of our community, but they're really palaces for children. A little bit of a different, it, it technically, it, it actually technically was a library to a certain extent. So did you ever see the movie With Honors with Joe Pesci and Brendan yes. Fraser? So, yes. so, so there is a scene in the film, great film, by the way, for those who haven't had the chance to, to see it. Um, Joe Pesci, of course, from, from Goodfellas, one of the bad guys in Home Alone, he plays a homeless gentleman and he is on the campus of Harvard University Montgomery Kessler, played by Brendan Fraser, uh, formerly of Encino Man. I know that most people are, they, they kind of know him from the whale now, but we, you know, we go back to Encino Man, you know, back in the day, so to speak. But he plays this Harvard student, Montgomery Kessler, who is so obsessed with graduating with honors. Uh, we're not going to spoil the film here because we don't like to give away the whole kit and caboodle on the children's book spotlight series. But in the film, he ends up losing his thesis, which he's working so diligently on. And when Brennan Frazier, when Montgomery Kessler comes up to uh, Simon Wilder, that's that, that's the homeless gentleman's name. There's there's a part in the film where he says, and 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 we'll we'll p we'll 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 shift it from PG thirteen to make it more G here for the children's book spotlights. But he says, like he he calls him Harvard. He's like Harvard. I have a palace. He used the term in the film. I have a palace because he was surrounded with. He he lived, I believe, in the basement of, I think, the library, if I'm not mistaken. So again, I'm sharing this exciting story, not only as an unlocking of a childhood memory, so to speak, but to remind children and to remind adults that there's so many really cool things about libraries. The fact that it's free. I mean, yes, you have to be able to, you know, get your own library card, so to speak. But again, you know, renting... It, I'm old enough, you're old enough to remember when, you know, because I also used to work at Blockbuster Video. That's another unlocking of a childhood memory, right? We could actually rent movies and rent DVDs. So you can still rent films at the library as well, too. But, you know, cracking the cover and diving into the pages, and we won't give away the whole kit and caboodle, but I really love how it's shaped and frameworked in the form of a thank you letter. Because mm -hmm. we as adults can be very cynical, we can be very jaded, and our kids can pick up on that. And it's so important to every day, you know, whether it be start the day to end the day in between, to really remind ourselves of the gratitude that we have in our lives. Because the more that we have to be thankful for, the more the world gives us to be thankful for. So starting off, for example, dear library, thank you for warm welcomes as I skip you through your open doors. And I also love the, the insertion of the word nook. That is one of my favorite words. Like I, I, I always tell parents and educators in the San Diego here and kids as well too, um, out here in America's finest city to create your own outdoor book nook. That's one of my favorite things. You know, like when the weather gets a little bit better, you have your own outdoor book nook. Um, take us through the, take us through the story if you could without giving away the whole kit and caboodle. But but noting the fact that like I mean I can only imagine like when you since you you have a lot of experience being with libraries as an author from your own childhood being able to have like there were there were edits I'm sure that were a part of this story and like you you had to take out I'm sure some of the things that you know libraries do offer and the things that you are grateful for for libraries so was that a little bit challenging because this actually could have been more than a picture book it could have been. A, a little bit of a longer form read in the process. 
Yeah, yeah. So it was in with the structure of how the story is told, I think there are 14 total spreads um, in the book. And so I had to have an opening and closing. And so I think I had room for maybe 10 examples to put in the book. And it was really hard to narrow them down. Some I took inspiration from, from my public library where I live now, the LaGrange Public Library. So people in my area will see some familiar things. Um, I took inspiration from the Midlothian Public Library, which is the library where I grew up and who I dedicated the book to because they really just shaped me as a reader, as a child. Um, so there were a lot of things. I can't remember a specific example of what I had to take out, but I had so much to choose from. And I wanted it to be, like I said, more than just about the books because a library offers so many, so many things for our community. One of the things, um, fast forwarding to the, to the end of the story, still not giving away the whole kit and caboodle, at the very end of the story, there's there's this feeling of inclusivity. There's this feeling of community. And we've seen even more so since we've last connected. There is that much more divide, that much more division in the world. Pe you know, you have people that are fighting. We're seeing, I mean, all of, I mean, everything ranging from, you know, more fires and more uh more crime that's being committed to you know atrocities that are happening out in the world in terms of wars right and i see this final spread that rob beautifully created and you see people of different ages races ethnicities and they're all connected through a common love of reading Talk to that because there's something, you know, I, I've said this since day one, almost from the first episode of the children's book spotlight series six years ago. There's something about children's books. And even if you want to kind of broaden that a little bit more, there's something about reading. You can't put a finger on it. Sometimes you can't even put it into words, but I guess I am asking you to put it into words in this particular instance. What is it about libraries? What is it about reading? What is it about children's books? Those three facets that really bring people together, that really kind of, you know, soften and open up our hearts a little bit more and allow us to be able to really enjoy life more, connect with our own creativity. If you could really put that into words, what does that look like, sound like, and feel like for you? To me, I think a story is a type of exploration. It's a way for you to experience some of the world you may not have ever experienced yet. It's a way for you to explore the world beyond your own backyard. And it's a way to have um, things reflected back to you, especially for kids to see someone who looks like them in a book can be very important for children that maybe when we were growing up weren't wasn't readily available to um, kids of different backgrounds. So I think that a book and the art of story, storytelling's been, you know, around as long as mankind, right? And it it's a way to express ourselves. Yes. And it's a way as the reader to take in the world, to experience it, to feel, and to maybe escape sometimes. You, I have this sense, like when I'm reading, you know, when you're reading and then someone comes in the room and you're like, oh, wait, where was I? Like you, your mind, to me, that's what happens to me. My mind goes somewhere else. I forget that I'm sitting in my living room. I forget that I have dirty dishes in the sink to clean. I just go into this other world and it's just very freeing to me. And there really is something, I, I, I used the word earlier, the word distraction. If there is such thing as a healthy distraction, it's enjoying a good book. And, and, and yeah. it really, there, there's even the part of me that really doesn't want to classify it as a distraction. It's a matter of, it's a way to be able to nurture your mind, your heart, your soul, to expand your creativity, to expand your horizons, and, and just know that there are that many more magical worlds out there as well, too. And, and this is also one of the essential things. I'm really glad that, you know, most schools, you know, continue to operate in this fashion. There's a lot of schools that have libraries within them. So even if kids don't have the opportunity to go to their local library, which we wholeheartedly encourage them to do so, 
but to be able to utilize the resources that they have at their own school library. I remember, you know, growing up, the school that I went to, 14 Holy Helpers, which is no longer in existence. The building is still there, but the school closed in, in, in the Buffalo area. And I remember it was like, I think once or twice a week, we would go to the library, we would look around, we could check out whatever books that we wanted to. You know, this is, again, it was a little bit of a different time. You know, this was, you know, pre-computer, pre-internet, pre-everything. So again, it's also, and, and this leads me into my next question as well as, is that amidst the change that happens in the world and the kids can do anything with screens and devices, we're seeing things die. We're seeing, you know, whether it be, you know, main, this is another story for another time, I'm sure, but, you know, as the result of the minimum wage increase, you're seeing a lot of restaurants that are closing. You're seeing a lot of things that have been around for a long period of time go away just like that. Sometimes it can be overnight. Um, I, I tend to use the word custodians quite a bit because we are custodians in our own way for children. Why do you feel that it's essential, that it's paramount even, for us to be able to let our children know, not even just about the library, about the benefits of going to the library, the whole experience, because it really is an experience with a capital E. Why is it really essential and paramount, maybe now more than ever before, to let our children know about libraries? Because if we don't do that, libraries could become a dying breed and that's something that I, I could just not envision a world without libraries and bookstores. Right. Yeah, I think the important part is what a library represents is knowledge. And how do we become stronger versions of ourselves? How do we become more aware of ourselves, aware of our community, of our relationship um, with others through gaining knowledge. And that's what I think libraries offer, whether it's through a book, whether it's through an audio book, you know, whether it's um, through what you're downloading on your e-reader at home, all of those different ways to get a story into a reader's hands are all valuable. And we, as a library user, I I want everybody to go into their library and see what it has to offer and to, to see the feeling of the welcoming they will get from library staff. Librarians are so well, not only just well-trained in the literature world, but by nature, as I found interacting with librarians, are um, want to help you. They're there to serve you. They're there to serve the library. And they want to find that perfect story for every child or every adult. Um, so yeah, let's let's keep them thriving for sure. And uh, I'm really glad that, that you touched upon that. Um, two other things briefly that I wanted to mention before we we uh, crack the cover and dive into the pages and, and give little sneak peeks at what's to come for you on your end of things. One of the things about, the two of the things about libraries is that they are safe spaces for kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, we as, as as adults and parents and caregivers and custodians of our children, we may wonder, like, where can our kids be kids? Where can our kids be safe? And libraries really are a safe space. Mm -hmm. This goes back to our last trolley stop together on episode number 141 of the Children's Book Spotlights, which we've included in the description below. You reminded kids again about expressing your emotions, feeling your feelings, that it can and will be okay. So for, for those kids who have a little bit of whether it be social anxiety or fear of fitting in or what's my place in the world, mm -hmm. libraries are really those, they're, they're there every day for kids to remind them of all of that. And plus they're also quiet spaces. Yes. It's long since been said that the most beautiful music is found between the notes, mm. right? And oftentimes we can do our part to be able to treasure life that much more when we're not talking, when we're not communicating, and when we're listening more. It, it, I can admit, it took me, I always kind of, uh, you know, admit over time that my time walking this earthly plane has taught me many things, one of which is to do less of this even though as a, as a publicist, it, there's a lot of this, right? But to have more of this mm -hmm. and a little bit 
less of this, so to speak. So, and again, like just the fact that it's it's a it's it's a very short story, but it's a very powerful story at the same point in time as well, too. We hope that you are enjoying episode number 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series. We are beginning to wind down our time on episode number 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series with our featured guest, children's author, Lisa Katzenberger. We encourage all of you, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and again, of course, our fellow shining stars, to head on over to Lisa's official website, which we've included in the description below, to also head on over to Amazon.com if that is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. Be sure to purchase, read, enjoy your copy of a love letter to my library. It is now available. One of the many ways that you can pledge your support for Lisa and the team at Sourcebook Kids is to leave a five-star review for Love Letter to My Library that lets them know that they're doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, and educators, and for those who love great children's books. If you head on over to your favorite local library, your favorite children's and or independent bookstore, this is our little tip of the cap analogy, as we like to say here at the Children's Book Spotlight, so they do not stock their copies of A Love Letter to My Library, make that kind recommendation. Let them know that you heard about it here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. Trolley Stop, episode number 214 to be precise. And again, for all educators, teachers, principals, librarians, school superintendents, I know you're doing your part to facilitate author school visits for not only the back to school season, but the 2024-2025 school year. Be sure to head on over to Lisa's official website, which we've included in the description below. And of course, you can facilitate your own author school visit because, again, just a love letter to my library. One of the great books that your that your students can learn about, enjoy, and really again helps them to connect with their creativity. And there's so many more things that are found within the course of a library. If you're wondering again, what are what is the goodness found within a library? And you need again that love letter. You need that little tutorial, that little refresher. That's where a, a love letter to my library comes in. You are busy in 2024 and you're doing the good kind of busy, not the busy for the sake of just like, I'm going to do things just, you know, to pass the time. It's long since been said that when you do something that you love, it doesn't feel like you like you're working a day in your life. And I remember uh, one of one of my dear friends, he's a fellow beloved neighbor and shining star in the world of children's literature, John Parr. I remember what, shortly after it was first introduced to him years ago, he said, John, you and I, we get to wake up every morning. And that's a blessing in itself. But we get to better the lives of children. We get to do what we do and put smiles on the faces and the hearts of children. And we get to make a living off of it. Like, how great is that, right? And so being able to have this year that you're having, undoubtedly, it's going to make you feel really good. We talk about expressing your emotions and feeling your feelings. You have not one, not two, not three, but four books come out this year. Now, again, for those who are kind of a little curious about the behind the scenes, peeling the veil back of the work of children's literature, uh, projects are worked on at different points in time. Before we talk a, a little bit about your other books, could you share with us like Give us that little bit of that look-see, that peeling the veil back, like knowing the fact that you have four projects to work on. I'm sure that being mindful of your time and being able to, you know, like, and being a mom on your end of things, like it's a matter of like, okay, 24 hours in a day, check. Eight hours for sleep, check. And then you break down the other time doing the other things. Could you share this just like, what's that's been like from a creativity perspective on your end of things? The balancing of the time and, you know, working things at, at, you know, working things on at different points in time. And then now knowing the fact that, like, it's here. It's not just, you know, when you're on social media or talking to, a, you know, a, a parent or a school and you say, well, coming soon. Well, the cool thing is that when the coming soon becomes the now available, it's really a good feeling. So also talk to us about, you know, before we talk about the books specifically, could you share this? Just what's this like for you now, knowing that the fruits of your labor you're you're now starting to see and will see into the latter half of 2024? Um, it's it's wild. It's unbelievable. Like I can't believe that this is happening to me. I can't believe that I've been able to get books published and people are out there reading them. <laughs> Um, it's just a little mind boggling, but it's been a wonderful gift. Um, I'm busy with events. I have events at a couple um, local libraries and Midlothian Public Library. I'm going to Saturday, my hometown library where I grew up. So I'm so excited to do that. Um, 
And one of the other things I'm doing right now is、um, I'm teaching writing classes. So I have told myself that I can only do so much. I, my priorities right now are to promote my books, teach my classes, and honor my students. Obviously, take care of my kids, but that's on another plate.、Um, and any projects that I need to really dig deep into, like a middle grade novel I'm working on, I just have to pause for a couple months this summer. I have to focus on the books coming out. I have a few things of picture book projects that I can make some tweaks and revisions to, but I had to say to myself, I do not have the mind space, the time, the energy to work deeply on deep revisions of this novel. I will in August when my kids go back to school and things slow down a little bit. So, I had to give myself that grace and to say, you're not going to be able to do everything for a while, and that's okay. So, that's kind of how I've been balancing things、um, this summer. And I, one of the common threads, I, I remind myself of this, I remind Little Forest of this, I remind clients of mine, friends of mine, is the importance of showing yourself grace.、Mm-hmm. Because we're not Superman. We're not Wonder Woman. And I, I, I've seen over, over the 10 years of doing PR publicity work for children's authors, there's a lot of, and just in different genres and different walks of life, people can burn out. Like、yeah. you can love doing what you're doing so much and be work, 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 kind of like you're, you're like an unhealthy version of Pac Man. You remember Pac Man back in the day would be like, like this? That's my like work, 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 right?、Um, So, the fact that you're balancing everything, I find,、uh, find pretty cool. You're of the next three books, the next one that I want to talk about is your Croc and Gator chapter book series. One of the things that I really love about this right off the bat is the fact, you know, there's a lot of books on dogs and there needs to be, right? Because they're so cute, right? Little Forest will, will you know, f- fully vouch for that. There's, there's books on dogs, there's books on cats, not a lot of books on crocodiles. Right. So, and then also you're tapping into the chapter book genre because, again, you know, even though like, you know, our, our bread and butter, our pride and joy, a lot of what we feature here on the children's book spotlight series are picture books. Eventually, kids want to be challenged or they want to have a little bit more of a longer form story. So, could you share with us a little bit more about the first book in the series, Swamp Ranger School, and what kids will learn and enjoy when they read? That new book, the second book of the four in 2024 that are coming out.、Mm-hmm. So, I,、um, you were talking about origin stories earlier. This story came from、um, a, the idea came from a swamp tour I did with my family when we were traveling. And I had never seen a swamp before.、Um, I found it beautiful. I learned so much. And I was like, this would make a great setting for a story. So, I came up with these characters, Croc and Gator, who are kind of really big opposites. And they meet together as they're training in a school to become、um, junior rangers in their swamp. So, it's inspired by the Junior Ranger Parks program that my kids have participated in as well. And so, they go to school and they have to learn about the swamp, they have to learn the ranger rules. And it's a、um, training for them to become junior rangers to help protect the swamp. And they both have different personalities, different perspectives, and different things that they want to get out of the experience,、um, which creates you know, a little conflict between them.、Um, so that's、um, what Croc and Gator Swamp Ranger School, what kids are going to find. And those newly independent readers who want to read a book on their own, I think.、Um, I hope they would like that one. And the fact that, again, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning of our conversation, the fact how it's that real life experience, right? You know, even though, you know, the characters, they're not, you know, like real, like, you know, real life in, in that kind of the fact that you were able to have this personal experience. And you said, you know what? I think this is a great idea for a book because otherwise someone would have had that experience and had that exact same idea. That's one of the things about ideas. Eventually, if you get that idea, like it's, it's there in, in your mind and your heart for a reason. But if you don't follow through on it, that idea is going to go back out into, into, the, into the stratosphere and someone else、go. will get that idea.、Um, again, one of the things that I really feel、um, 
why your work is some of the best in the world of children's literature. You're, you're really not even just big on connecting kids with their emotions and feelings, but that is that is one of your staples. And I feel that, again, when kids are able to express their emotions, when they're able to feel their feelings, we can do our part as parents and caregivers and custodians of our children so that we're not creating the next generation of kids that need the the Ritalin or the or the or the anxiety or the depression medication. There's probably new different medications that are out there. And, and, and again, you know, being for kids to just I feel ultimately at their core when kids can feel comfortable in their own being right they have a greater chance of enjoying life being successful and not being on the therapist's couch or or, or needing those sorts of uh substances on their end of things you have another book that's literally just come out and depending upon when people are enjoying episode number 214 of the children's book spotlight series there's a very good chance that these books are actually now available but again you know we're taking things in stride from when this episode is actually premiering i can do it even if i'm scared finding the brave you could you give us a little bit of a sneak peek on what kids will be able to learn about in the process and, and really connecting with that threat especially right now because one of the things that has shifted in the past two years since you've last joined us in the program there can be a lot more for kids to be scared of than mm -hmm. what there was even just two years ago so could you talk to us as well about the importance of releasing this book now the timeliness aspect of it. Not even just for the back to school season, but the fact that not only kids need to hear this, but also us as adults as well too. Yeah, I really, with this story, I really wanted to address that everybody experiences fear. Everybody gets scared. They may not admit it, but I bet they do. And it's a normal human emotion. But we can let fear hold us back sometimes. I know I've had experiences with that myself and have learned to address my fears and my anxieties to overcome them so that I can move forward with life. I can continue to explore my creativity. I can, can continue to explore different parts of the world. And by letting kids know that They've got this. They have the tools inherently in them to survive and thrive. And teaching them how some steps in this book, some it's kind of been called like a how-to book too, um, to learn what to do when you have that fear, how to address it, how to face it, and how to move on beyond it. So that's what I'm trying to share um, with this story. And again, being able to, to have, this is one of the main reasons why children's books are essential is, is that let's say if, if a parent or an educator doesn't necessarily know how to bridge the conversation to the child, to their student about said emotion, said feeling, this is where children's books come in. When Fred Rogers spoke in front of, um, in front of, uh, uh, Capitol Hill, to receive $20 million worth of funding, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, but back in the day, it was in the late 60s, when he spoke with Senator John Pastore, he used the phrase, resource of care. He said, Senator Pastore, what I do, AKA Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, is a resource of care. It's a resource of care that I provide to kids. In many respects, and we've shared this again since day one of the children's book spotlight series, that children's books are resources of care for children, especially when it comes to connect, helping them to connect with their emotions and their feelings. You're going to be capping off your 2024, and this is a very special project that's near and dear to your heart, titled It Belongs to the World, Frederick Banting and the Discovery of Insulin. That's courtesy of our friends and neighbors at Harper Kids. There are a lot of children out there that have diabetes, and in, in some form, there's adults that have that as well, too. Children's books, when they can take the time to connect with an origin story, they help kids to learn about people, to be able to learn about not only people, but people's journeys. Could you share this a little bit more about why this project is so important to you and a little bit more? I mean, obviously, again, you know, people are, you know, kids are going to be learning about Frederick Bunting. They're going to be learning about the discovery of insulin, but even that much more than that. What are what are kids going to take away from from reading your final what will be newly released book of 2024? Um, yeah, so. 
we were talking a little bit earlier about how the past couple of years was growth for me and I wanted to challenge myself. One of the things I wanted to do was write a picture book biography to try my hand at nonfiction. And so I wanted to find a subject that I was passionate about, that I would research, 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 and still want to research even more, something that I had a personal connection to. So my son um, has type 1 diabetes, which means his pancreas doesn't produce insulin, and he needs a supply of insulin to survive. All type 1 diabetics do. So when I was learning about diabetes and insulin, and I read the, the origin story of Frederick Banting, who discovered insulin, and his persistence and his selflessness of just pushing, pushing, pushing to take his idea that he had to work in the lab countless hours to get the insulin produced, to give it a, the patent away selflessly saying insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. Um, that really inspired me. And so, yes, it's a story about diabetes and insulin, but it's also a story of a person who cared so much for others that he put their needs ahead of his own. And it's a it's a very important story as well, too, from the fact that it, it has a really good, it, not even just the information that it shares, you know, this is who Frederick Bunting is and here's why he's known, but being able to remind kids to remind ourselves that when we create something, it's not necessarily ours. When we create whatever it is may be, we literally give it as a gift to the world. And so again, all four books will be available by the time the end of the year rolls around. Again, you can stay connected with Lisa via her official website. You can also stay connected with her via her social media platforms, which we have included in the description below. We always like to be able to provide some supportive information for parents, for caregivers, for grandparents, for educators, for those who love great children's books, so they can immediately extract after watching and enjoying a children's book spotlight series so that they can not only implement it into their own lives, but the lives of the children that they, that they love, that they're blessed to watch over and protect in the process. Specifically speaking about, you know, going back to the heart of our conversation and talking about libraries, Specifically speaking, if people do need a little bit of a refresher when people go into a library, so to speak, what are those three, like if you could say the top three things on your, and, and this may be just your own personal two cents, so to speak, but even, you know, kind of incorporating in your experience, working with other parents, you know, working with librarians, doing events at libraries, what are some of the specific like the three top things that really libraries offer and are about that really kids, even today's kids, whatever they're called now, Generation Z, there's there's the different generations of kids, right? That even they'll say, aha, I get that. Why, what are those specific things that come to mind on your end of things? Why, why libraries are go-tos for us mm -hmm. and for our kids? Yeah, I think that libraries offer a sense of community. They offer intellectual freedom. They offer the right to read whatever you would like to read. Um, and as I talked about before, they offer knowledge and in a warm, welcome, welcoming, safe space. So I think that, um, you know, if you haven't been to your local library in a little while, pop on in. Be brave. Don't be, you know, don't be shy about it. The librarians will be warm and welcoming, I'm sure. And there's just so much to offer in, as you called them, these palaces in our communities. That's true. Palaces and uh, and pillars of support. Very much so. Um, and also, again, reminding the fact that, again, you know, libraries are free. And a lot of parents might be a little, you know, financially conscious now more so than ever before. Nothing wrong with that. But again, when you, the, the memories are priceless, your kids have exciting adventures and then priceless memories can be created. And that is a good feeling. Those are good feelings in the words of our favorite friend and neighbor, Mr. Rogers. Undoubtedly, 
this project. You know, it, it's a reminder of life. Life teaches us each and every day. It's very easy for us to think when we're done with high school, we're done with college, boom, we're done with school. But there, there's a term that we tend to use regularly on the children's book spotlight series called Earth School. We learn every day. We get assignments every day in different ways, shapes, and forms. And then every once in a while, we've got a really cool graduation. And then we level up to the next part of our life, so to speak. What has specifically a love letter to my library? What has this project taught uh, taught it about yourself and taught you about life? Um, I think it has taught me kind of where my passion lives. It has taught me gratefulness. It has taught me to remember to be thankful for things that maybe sometimes you take advantage of and you're like, oh, I go to the library every couple of weeks. When I was a kid in the summer, my mom was a teacher. We would go every week and come out with armfuls of books, the both of us. And um, they're just wonderful places. And it's taught me to be happy for the freedom to read. And it's taught me to be happy for the people who support it and be thankful for all of the work that they do. And another reminder, and I'm really glad that you actually shared this, when you take the time to go to your local library, thank them. Not only thank the libraries, but thank them. You know, one of the things is, is that, and, and we saw this during the pandemic, but like educators need to be paid more, librarians need to be paid more. Um, yes. My mom worked at the at, at a library. I've had family members. My, my grandmother, uh, you know, ha had a connection, you know, uh, I believe with the library, if I'm not mistaken. But again, we all know someone who works in a library or, or many people who work in a library as well. And then this is, you know, it's a love letter to them. It's not even just a love letter to mm -hmm. libraries. One of the fastest growing recommendations in the world of children's literature, it's kind of like a little homage in a little bit of a different way. You remember back in the day when Siskel and Ebert would rate a movie, I believe, you know, they were beloved in Chicago, right? There was the one yes. with, with, with the Chronicle and I think one with the Sun Times. When they loved the film, they gave it two thumbs up, right? But one of the fastest growing endorsements in the world of children's literature is when Little Forest gives two paws up for a children's book that we are featuring on the children's book spotlight here. Little Forest is proudly getting two paws up for a love letter to my library. So again, we encourage all of you, again, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course, our fellow shining stars to head on over to Lisa's official website, which we've included in the description below. He's right on cue. He, he, he does that not even on, he does it on command, I guess, so to speak. But then again, he doesn't. Head on over to Lisa's official website, which we've included in the description below. You can also head on over to Amazon.com. Be sure to leave a five-star review after purchasing, reading, and enjoying a love letter to my library if you feel called and inclined to do so. One of the many ways you can pledge your support for Lisa and for our friends and neighbors at Sourcebooks Kids is by leaving a five-star review for a love letter to my library that lets them know that they're doing wonderful and much-needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and for those who love great children's books. Again, for, for all educators out there, if you are facilitating, we know that you're already facilitating your author's school visits for the back to school season and the 2024-2025 school year. Be sure to head on over to Lisa's official website, which we've included in the description below to be able to facilitate your own author's school visit, whether it be in person or remote with Lisa as part of the back to school season in the 2024-2025 school year. And then again, for all local live libraries for all children's and independent bookstores they're the pillars of our community if you walk in and you do not see that they stock their copies of a love letter to my library make the the kind recommendation let them know that you heard about it here on episode number 214 of the children's book spotlight series and as i mentioned of course as well you can stay connected with lisa via her official social media platforms which we've included in the description below and see how far that we've come since february 2022 you can of course watch episode number 141 of the children's book spotlight series lisa's previous trolley stop on the program and again be able to enjoy her previous work when she joined us for the first time as well too now when we hear the trolley that means that it is time to go. But fear not, there are many more magical trolley stops to come here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. But before we mention that, raise your hand if you have had fun on episode number one, 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. We see hands from myself, hands from Lisa, hands from the little ones on screen. Little Force has his paws up. That means, as we like to say, mission accomplished, job well done. But again, there are many more magical trolley stops to come on the Children's Book Spotlight series. Literally in just a few trolley stops, 
we are going to be, and if I'm not mistaken, it actually, I believe it's the next trolley stop. We are going to be kicking off our 10 year anniversary celebration of being of service to children's authors here at PR from the heart. And then of course the back to school season will be upon us. And you know what that means? The six year anniversary celebration of the children's book spotlight series. A lot of confetti is popping here in the PR from the heart offices and in our studios here. So if you are a children's author, if you're a middle grade author, and would love to share your inspiring story in the release of your brand new children's or middle grade book on a forthcoming edition of the children's book spotlight series, just as Lisa shared here this week on the program. We encourage you to head on over to our official website, prfromtheheart.com, or connect with us via any of our social media platforms that you now see on screen. Instagram, Facebook, X, all at PR from the Heart. Little tip of the cap to one of our favorite friends and neighbors. Again, you remember him and you love him as the beloved Mr. McFeely on the popular long-running children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We know him and we love him as David Newell for the past now three plus years. David has joined us and continues to join us each and every month on the Neighborly Reviews bookcast where we, as a little tip of the cap to his character, Mr. McFeely on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, we deliver heartfelt reviews of the newest children's books that are available from the shining stars in the world of children's literature. We encourage you, if you are a children's author, we'd love to have your new children's book be reviewed and spotlighted and featured on a forthcoming edition of the Neighborly Reviews Bookcast. You know where to connect with us via our official website, prfromtheheart.com, or any of our social media platforms on screen. And again, as part of our 10-year anniversary celebration, the back-to-school season, the holiday season, there are many authors whose journeys are taking flight. Over the past 10 years, we have been so privileged and blessed and honored to be of service to some of the top children's authors in the world of children's literature, ranging from John Parra and Catherine Roy to the beloved children's entertainers, Sharon, Lois, and Bram. Now you have the opportunity to be a part of the PR from the Heart family. It truly is the best time if you are looking to facilitate a book media tour in a city of your choosing or a national book media tour, as many of our authors are crisscrossing this beautiful country of ours, whether it be for the back to school season, for the holiday season, you can connect with us via our official website, prfromtheheart.com. Schedule your courtesy connection call. Let us see how we can be of service to you. Again, one final time, we encourage all of you to head on over to Lisa's official website, as well as amazon.com. Purchase, enjoy, read over and over again your copies of A Love Letter to My Library, courtesy of our friends and neighbors at Source Book Kids. Be sure to leave that five-star review when you head on over to Amazon. Be sure to head over to your favorite local library, your favorite children's and or independent books, or make that kind recommendation that they stock a love letter to my library and the eventful chance that they do not stock those as well too. And stay connected with Lisa again on social media, because again, those other wonderful books that she shared, depending upon when you are watching and enjoying this episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series, those are love letters that you can give to yourself, especially if you are a reading aficionado, if your kids love reading as well too, no matter what age, Lisa has got your little one and the inner child within you covered as well, too. The last two ways that we always close out every children's book spotlight series episode, Lisa, is a little bit of a tip of the cap, and I know that you had experienced this previously. We always, we, we feel his spirit here on the program. Mr. Rogers, in many ways, shapes, and forms, he reminded us of our inherent worth and our inherent value. And he did that, whether it be through his time on the neighborhood, college talks, commencement speeches, and most notably when he received his Lifetime Achievement Award before he received, or before he passed shortly from stomach cancer thereafter, he encouraged us to remember those who helped love us into being. And that was his way of saying that, you know, remember that thank you letter or write that thank you letter to those people who reminded you of your worth and your value and the fact that there is so much to celebrate about you. Specifically when it comes to this project, and even just over the course of the past two years, the new people that have come into your life, the relationships that you've rekindled, who are some of the people that have helped love you, Lisa Katzenberger, into the game? Oh, I have to um, thank my mom and um, my dad. My parents were um, great supporters of me and creative Lisa, who was writing stories kind of everywhere, which was fantastic. And um, of course, now as an adult, my wonderful partner in all of this, my husband, Mike, and my two kids, Sydney and Ryan, um, who believe in me and support me along this kind of wild creative journey I'm taking. Mm. And it's all, I appreciate you sharing those individuals because it's, it's long since been said, and I'll paraphrase Mr. Rogers, that 
You know, whether those people are near or far, whether they're walking on this earthly plane or whether they're or whether they're looking down from heaven, that they're smiling, they're shining down, knowing the impact that you're making, not only on your own life, but the impact that you're making on other people's lives, especially our children as well, too. And we're also Disney buffs. There's a little refresher here in the children's book spotlight series that Disney magic reminds us that we have the ability to bring in for, to form and shape our dreams, our desires, our goals, our ambitions. We have the ability to fulfill our own wishes. And thus we have the opportunity to bring to form and shape the dreams, the desires, the goals, the ambitions. We have the ability to help fulfill the wishes of those people that are in our lives, our family members, our friends, our colleagues, those who were called to be of service to. So we go back to the year 1992. We go back to the beloved Disney animated classic, Aladdin. We remember the late Robin Williams. We remember the genie of the lamb. And we have a little segment that we like to call Three Wishes. Now, for those guests who have been on board the program previously, these wishes, the only other automatic disqualifier is that when someone returns back aboard the program, that they can't ask for three more wishes, right? So these wishes are meant for the world. They can be for the children of the world. They can be for the planet overall. Um, you know, they can even be for, for special people in your life. But you're being given three more wishes and their wishes to be able to just beam out everywhere, what would those three wishes be? Oh gosh. Um, I wish, if I say this kind of broadly, I wish for peace in the world. I wish for happiness in people's lives. And I wish for people believing enough in themselves to pursue their dreams. Hmm. And that is, that's a good reminder because especially within the fast paced society in which we live and, you know, people can feel challenged. They can feel like they're struggling, wondering, you know, can I do this? Can I get to a point where I, I write a children's book, let alone four children's books during the course of, of one year? And it's just a reminder that, you know, people have that magic within them and they have the ability again to bring to form and shape their dreams, their desires, their goals, their ambitions. The trolley has been patient. When we hear the trolley, as I said, that means that it is time to go. We want to thank you for your continued support of PR from the heart, for your continued support of the children's book spotlight series, for your continued support of children's authors and illustrators, such as Lisa, who are doing again, wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books for local libraries and children's and independent bookstores, for they are the pillars of our community. But above all else, we want to thank you for helping us to walk home the children of the world one final time, our fellow shining stars. We felt his spirit throughout the course of our time together in episode number 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. In many ways, shapes, and forms, Fred Rogers reminded us again of our inherent worth and value. And interestingly enough, he did it in a very unique way. Did you know that Mr. Rogers weighed 143 pounds? during his entire natural adult life. As I like to say, maybe in a past life, he might've met Ponce de Leon because he sure as heck found the fountain of youth. There's one letter in I, four letters in love, and there's three letters in you. As Little Forest was kind to spend some time with us here in our neighborhood, as Lisa was kind enough to spend some time with us here in our neighborhood, as a little tip of the cap to Mr. Rogers, we share our favorite three numbers officially in closing to put the bow on episode number 214 of the children's book Spotlight series. Our favorite numbers are 243. There's two letters in we, four letters in love, three letters in you. That is our reminder that we see you, that we like you, that we love you just the way that you are, that you are liked, that you are loved, that you are whole, that you are healthy, that you are complete, that you are special, just the way that you are right now in the process. And, you know, while you're writing a love letter to your local library, write that love letter to yourself. That's a good way to be able to spend time during the course of some, write the so many amazing lists of characteristics that you love about your library, but do it for yourself at the same point in time, because you are your own library in many ways, shapes, and forms. Am I right? So again, for Little Forest, for Lisa Katzenberger, for myself, John Massalonis, we hope that you have enjoyed episode number 214 of the Children's Book Spotlight series, and we'll be having more celebratory energy to share for our next trolley stop and beyond as we officially kick off the 10-year anniversary celebration of being of service to children's authors here at PR from the Heart. Thank you for helping us to walk home the children of the world our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow shining stars. Goodbye for now.